How's everybody doing? Thanks for staying. Appreciate your patience and your diligence in making it all the way to the end. I promise you I'm the last person that stands between you and a beverage, uh, perhaps even a cocktail. Um, so because all the speakers did a really great job telling you how lipid nanoparticles work, um, I'm going to depart real quick from my script and, and tell you a Frank Slack-inspired story. Um, my first uh, commercial job was for a company called Insight Genomics. And, uh, and Insight, um, at that time, we thought that maybe perhaps 3% of the genome uh, stood for coded material. And the other 97% was quote unquote junk. Okay, um, so Insight in its infinite wisdom decided to sequence uh, only EST libraries. And then they would map the EST sequence to whatever was known of the genomic backbone. And we wound up with hundreds of thousands of sequences uh, based on ESTs that were, we didn't know what they were. We didn't know what microRNAs were. We didn't know what long coding, uh, non coding RNA was. We didn't know anything about where these ESTs came from. But we bundled them into a database called LifeSeq Gold and sold it to 30 different pharmaceutical companies for millions of dollars. Um, so, and if any of you is wondering where I'm going with this story, uh, Insight is the company that sent the tow truck. So, we went into the water. Insight Genomics is no more. But um, in any event, um, so the, the question is, are you better off doing um, work and saying that you know what it is and ultimately finding out that it's wrong? Or are you better off saying, I got a bunch of really cool data here and I don't understand what it is or how it works or what it means? Um, so back to what I was asked to do, okay? Um, I think the first thing I was asked to do was give you another poll everywhere question. And it is not there. Is Gazina's question coming up or not coming up? It's at the top? Okay. Uh, what are the challenges that you face when encapsulating your payload? Okay. So I think these are static answers, but if you haven't answered, okay. They're not changing, so I guess we're good. All right. Um, so what I was asked to do uh, was present to you a little bit about how um, lipid nanoparticles can be used for nucleic acid delivery to neurons. Currently, there's a bunch of different transfection tools out there that offer potential for nucleic acid delivery, and not all of them are great for every application, and one of the trickier types uh, of cells to deliver nucleic acids to. Uh, our neurons. They don't really like to be electroporated. They don't like lipofectamine. So it, it's really hard to deliver um, to those cell types. And we felt like, oops, there was a, an opportunity here to create technology that was effective and easy to use and well tolerated. And that's what li uh, lipid nanoparticles enable you to do. Um, these same ionizable cationic lipids uh, that are used to encapsulate uh, oligos can be used for mRNAs, they can be used for plasmids, so it really opens up the platform to a, a number of different nucleic acids for encapsulation and delivery. Okay. Because these particles mimic endogenous molecules in incorporation with APOE, they really uh, mimic uh, endogenous lipoproteins, and they use endogenous methods of delivery into the cell. Um, in this case, we're using the LDL receptor pathway. Neurons and glia use the LDL receptor pathway to maintain cholesterol homeostasis, uh, lipid membrane stability, all those kinds of things. So neurons are a good potential target for LNP delivery if we can get them there, okay? Um, as you know, receptor-mediated endocytosis uh, release is important, and in this case, we're um, getting the ionizable lipid reprotonated in the cytosol and allowing the contents of uh, the nanoparticle to release into the cytosol of neurons, okay? 
So um, the balance of the talk is a few examples from the literature where people have demonstrated that this is in fact is happening and that we can see good results um, not only in primary neuronal cultures but also in vivo. So uh, the first example here is from the McVicker lab at UBC um, where we see an SI RNA to P10. Um, going out here all the way to very high dose here, you're seeing probably 70, 80% knockdown of the P10 protein. Um, these are from primary neuronal cultures. And for those of you who are into gymnosis or naked DNA, this is, whoops, this is the naked oligo. So the naked oligo did nothing. It was only by encapsulating an LNP were we able to see the knockdown, okay? Um, the other thing that's on this slide is that we are using here an LDH release assay to show that there is no toxicity as a result of delivering these LNPs to the neurons, okay? This very same LNP formulation was injected in vivo, and we see here a persistent and in sustained effect, about a 70% knockdown, all the way out to 15 days post-injection. Um, what we're also showing on this on the other panel is that uh, TNF-alpha as an index of a potential immune response to the injection uh, was unchanged in the injected hemisphere that received the LNP. Okay. Um, one more example here from the McVicker lab of the use of an LNP to do a functional genomics assessment, uh, both in vitro and in vivo in neuroscience research. Um, here, the guys in the McVicker lab were able to um, demonstrate exclusively that a specific chloride transport, ion transporter was responsible for the edema that is associated with traumatic brain injury. So over here, you see the SLC48A is, um, when that is knocked down, you get no change in the edema from a traumatic brain injury model. And when you see the SLC26A11, uh, you don't get any knockdown, or you don't get any edema when you knock that down, okay? Um, also, with electrophysiological data, uh, a similar observation was reported. So this is a, loose, oops, a luciferase siRNA control. Uh, that oligo did nothing, whereas the SLC oligo was able to stop um, the model um, for traumatic brain injury, okay? Um, so those are all oligo-based kinds of examples. This is a messenger RNA-based example. So this came out of uh, the Rare Disease Research Unit that's in uh, Pfizer Cambridge. It's a Friedrich's ataxia model. Um, and here we're replacing with an mRNA for frataxin, delivering it, and what we're showing here um, with the IVIS is that um, in conjunction with a firefly luciferase, we are able to get in expression of firefly luciferase mRNA in the cranial cavity from a ICV injection, but not from a tail vein injection. So we have to get these LNPs directly into the brain or directly into the CNS um, to see their effect. These particular LNPs do not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, but also here, um, a intrathecal injection between the th fourth and fifth lumbar region, uh, we delivered the frataxin mRNA and got expression in the dorsal root ganglia. So again, here, a messenger RNA delivery allowing you to get to the CNS. Okay, um, finally, last example here, and then I'm gonna stop talking altogether. Um, this is a, an example of encapsulating and delivering a plasmid DNA. Um, on the left-hand panel, that plasmid is for uh, GFP, and what you see here in red is actually a fluorescent dye that's actually incorporated into the lipid nanoparticle, so that's what's showing up in red. And then uh, in green, is the fluorescence from the GFP, and in blue uh, is, um, in that particular case, either DAPI or DARP32 or uh, another neural marker. 
And finally, this same group, uh, collaborators of ours at UC Davis, uh, were able to encapsulate a, a tail, uh, a transcription activator-like effector, into a plasmid and see uh, that it blocked, uh, in this case, a Huntington's mutation. So um, what we did here was try to show you a number of different platforms and applications whereby lipid nanoparticles can be used to deliver nucleic acids um, to primary neurons or CNS in vivo. So um, invite you to peruse any one of those papers if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that topic. But uh, other than that, I am done. Thank you. I'm finished, unless you have questions for me. Thanks.